Hi everyone and welcome to an introductory video where we're going to talk about the conceptions of truth. So you're going to be doing a few readings. Uh, there's one from a chapter uh, from Man is the Measure. You've read some from that book before. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and then a chapter from a book by Bertrand uh, Russell. But what this video is going to do is just going to introduce the basic ideas of the three different uh, truth checks or conceptions of truth that uh, those readings will discuss and we'll certainly discuss more in class. But before I get into those conceptions of truth, what I want to do is kind of set up why does truth matter? And I'm going to actually go ahead and read to you a couple of paragraphs from a book called Why Truth Matters um, because I really like the way this is written and I think it sort of sets up in a very fundamental way, why truth matters. So here we go. Humans are the only entities in the universe, for all we know, who have the capacity to make truth their object. The other needs and wishes, the ones that can conflict with truth, the needs and wishes for contentment, happiness, comfort, feelings of security and safety, and being protected, are ones that other beings can want and strive for. But truth? No. We by this strange, provocative, contingent accident of natural selection, have the kind of brain that can conceptualize reality as existing independent of us, and the possibility that we can discover what it is, along with the possibility that we can try to do that and fail, that we can think we've discovered it and be wrong, that we can discover part of it and be at a loss about the rest, and so on. So one intrinsic reason for thinking we ought to respect the truth and to find out what it is, which entails not fudging it whenever we don't like what we find, which entails deciding firmly in advance that we will put it first and all other considerations second. One reason for all of this is simply that we can, and that as far as we know, we are the only ones who can. We can, so we ought to. It would be such a waste not to, if only as a sort of tribute to the remarkable accident of natural selection to the staggering, amazing chain of being, from nothing to something, to life, to intelligence, to truth-seeking. So I think those couple of paragraphs set it up pretty nicely. Why should we care about truth? Well, to quote the reading, because as far as we know, we human beings living here on planet Earth, we're the only ones who can care about it. So maybe we are sort of compelled, required to care about it. Okay, enough of that reading. Let's talk a little bit about some of these uh, conceptions of truth. We have three of them, as you can see over here in the blue writing. We have correspondence, coherence, and pragmatic. I'm going to take these one by one. Correspondence. So essentially, if something is true due to correspondence, it's true because the knowledge claim corresponds to how something actually is in the world. So you make a statement, and that statement is true because we can connect it to something in the real world. Uh, it is true that the uh, atmosphere here in Hackensack, New Jersey, is made up of primarily nitrogen and oxygen. Why is that true? Because that corresponds to facts about the world. All right. So this is probably... Um, a fairly simple and straightforward concept of truth to understand. If you can pair it up with something that you can see out there and verify and justify in the real world, then that statement is going to be true by way of correspondence. Okay, let's pull that one down. Our next conception or truth check is coherence. Now this sort of feels like correspondence in that you need to check your statement against other statements beyond just the statement in question, but it's really about consistency. So is the knowledge claim that you're considering consistent with what you already know? All right, so you know certain things about the world, and if, as you come into something new that you haven't experienced before, you try to see if that new piece of the puzzle will fit. So in a way, this is kind of like truth by puzzle solving. If you can get that piece to fit in with the previous existing pieces, then we would say that's true by way of coherence. Okay? And then lastly, we have the pragmatic conception of truth. This idea essentially says that something is true if fundamentally 
It is useful. Does it work? Does it provide some utility? So something can be pragmatically true if when you consider it and you try to use it, it works for you. Now, I think traditionally speaking, these three conceptions of truth I've given to you are sort of presented in some kind of a hierarchy. I think generally stated, philosophers might suggest that uh, something that is true by correspondence is uh, more verified, has a stronger connection to the truth. Something that is true by coherence um, can be true, but it may be true in a less convincing way than something that would be true by way of correspondence. And then pragmatic, well, it may not necessarily connect to something that's um, true about the outside world, but it's useful, and so we consider it to be truthful in some sense. So there might be a, a hierarchy that we can consider here. Let's see, uh, let's start to make some connections. Let's see how these things might be um, used in the real world. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about Galileo. Now, as you probably know the story of Galileo, one of the things that he did is he put forth the idea um, that the sun is in the center of our universe, or at least in the center of our, um, of our local part of the universe. Now, what Galileo did is he got into a little bit of trouble with the church because Galileo said that the sun being in the center of our solar system was true essentially by correspondence. In other words, it was a fact about the way the universe is. Had he, and some friends of his, had suggested that he take this approach, had he said that, you know what, if we take the sun to be at the center of the universe or at the center of our solar system, that's actually pretty useful. It helps make our calendars more accurate. So he had friends who told him, you know what, Galileo, just say that it's useful, that it's practical to consider the sun to be at the center but not necessarily say that it's actually the way the world is. Well, Galileo sort of disagreed with that approach, and he said, no, the sun is, in fact, at the center of the solar system, and that's what the truth is, and that's what I'm going to put forth, and that's kind of what got him into some trouble with the Catholic Church back in his day. So had Galileo been satisfied with only a pragmatic conception of truth about the sun and its position, then maybe he wouldn't have pl been placed under house arrest and wouldn't have gotten into so much trouble with the Inquisition of the Catholic Church. All right, um, and you'll read a little bit about that in one of the readings um, from uh, Man is the Measure. Um, from uh, one of the other re readings, the, uh, the reading from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, it uh, spends a little bit of time talking about a ph philosopher named Susan Hack and her conception of pragmatic truth tests. And in there, she essentially says that uh, something that is pragmatically true actually has connections to correspondence and to coherence. Essentially, pragmatic ideas are useful because they actually correspond to facts about the world. At least this is true in, in science. So scientific ideas, while they may correspond to the way the world is, they are pragmatically true because they're useful because they correspond to facts about the world. Also, uh, Susan Hack says that ideas that are pragmatically true also cohere. And they cohere because a set of ideas that are pragmatically true have in common the fact that they're useful. And so that they have utility in common means that they cohere around the concept of utility. So I bring up this point that you'll see in the reading because it shows that there can be some overlaps between ideas that are pragmatically true, coherently true, and correspondingly true, right? Uh, Susan Hack developed the idea that these things can, in fact, overlap with, with one another. And then lastly, I just want to uh, draw your attention to uh, one of the other readings you're going to do, perhaps one of the readings that's a little bit more sophisticated and will take you some time to get through, and that is uh, the reading about uh, truth and uh, falsehood uh, by Bertrand Russell. That's taken from a chapter from one of his books. And Bertrand Russell, what he wants to do is he wants to develop not necessarily um, truth checks, but he actually is trying to go after what truth really is. 
not so much what you believe to be true. He's not talking about things that you might believe to be true. But he's going after what is truth itself. And in doing so, he talks about how truth, if it is something, if we are to define it, well, then it must also have an opposite. It must have the opposite of falsehoods. So there must be some way to distinguish between truth and falsehoods. And then he does talk about the role of belief in the idea of truth. And then he essentially uh, boils down to truth is something that can be verified by way of external checks. So ultimately, Bertrand Russell is going to argue for something that is really um, a, a concept of truth by way of correspondence. Okay, so that's a few minutes introducing some of the ideas about truth, hopefully with this video. Now that you get into the readings, you'll understand what you're going to be reading about. And I do think it would be helpful to, to take the readings, you know, start with man is the measure, go into the Stanford Encyclopedia bit about truth, and finish up with Bertrand Russell, because I think they do get sort of um, increasingly sophisticated uh, in that direction. And as you're doing the reading, try to keep in mind about maybe some of the strengths and weaknesses of these different conceptions of truth. What, um, what are their positives and maybe what are some of their drawbacks? Okay, so enjoy the readings and we'll pick up our conversation about truth in class in the next few days.